Hey guys, and welcome into our study of the book of Philippians. If you found your way here and you don't know who I am, my name is Jared. I'm the minister of students and discipleship at Stone Ridge Baptist Church, and I'm going to be leading you through this weekly study of this book. I'm pretty excited about it, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, before we get going into the text itself, I want to give you uh, first some tips uh, on doing some of this Bible study, and then I want to give you some background before we really dive into the beginning of chapter 1. So to begin with, just some tips to kind of help you out as we do book study. Uh, first, I want to recommend to you, if you have some time and you haven't already, go to our Stone Ridge Baptist Church YouTube page, and there's a playlist there of uh, videos on how to do hermeneutics, which is just Bible study. It's the art of interpreting the Bible. Uh, by Amy, our children's minister uh, here at Stone Ridge. And so she's put together these videos explaining how to really do good hermeneutics, good study of the Bible. Uh, and if you want to go check those out, I highly recommend them. So check those out to give yourself some information on how to do that Bible study. Uh, for myself here, are just some brief tips that I will give you before we get going. Uh, first is make sure that before you start here, you have a Bible that you can understand. You have a translation that you can understand. Um, if you struggle to read the King James, maybe don't study with the King James. Make sure you have a translation that you can understand, but is also reliable. Um, it's closer on the word-for-word the, the -word scale, maybe, than the thought-for-thought. -thought. Uh, so personally, I like to use either the ESV, the English Standard Version, or the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. And I'm actually going to be teaching from the CSB in this series. But as long as you have a translation you can understand and is reliable, you'll be good to go. Uh, again, in those hermeneutics videos that Amy has put out uh, on our YouTube page, she has a video that covers Bible translations. So if you have questions, maybe check that out. Uh, but as long as you've got one you can understand, you're good to go. The next thing I'll tell you is, as we're studying, don't be afraid to mark up your Bible, uh, to write in it, to put notes in it. Um, I am uh, kind of a book purist. I uh, spent several years teaching high school English. Uh, I love literature. I love to read. And so I'm a little bit of a purist when it comes to my books. Uh, I don't fold the corners down to mark pages. I don't write in them uh, unless it's something really, really uh, meaningful. I just have to. Not really a fan of it, but your Bible is made for you to take notes in. Uh, and so don't be afraid to mark up your Bible. For example, uh, as part of our preparation for our study, I've marked mine up a pretty good bit. So don't be afraid to do that as we study and go through. Uh, the next thing I'll tell you is make use of other study aids as you're studying your Bible. As we're going through this uh, process here, things like footnotes in your Bible, cross-references in your Bible, look those up, study them, figure out how they relate to the verse that you're looking at. Uh, if your Bible has study notes, feel free to use those, uh, or commentaries or other books or resources. Um, I will caution you, you should use these things after you have already done your own personal observation and study and interpretation uh, because you don't want to become reliant on what someone else has written, someone else's commentary or study notes in your Bible, and things like that. So uh, make sure that you, you use other resources after you have done your own personal study for a good while. Uh, just to kind of give you guys an idea, help you out, some of the stuff that I've used in preparation for this study, um, just to give credit where credit's due and to give you guys some ideas. Uh, one is this ultimate Bible guide. Um, shout out to my friend Michael Gentry from Lifeway for, for hooking me up with this. Uh, this is a pretty compact little volume, but it has inside it uh, kind of an overview of all 66 books of the Bible, kind of the historical uh, overview of it and thematic uh, points in each book, and then has different kinds of media to go along with each book, like maps or paintings or modern day photographs of locations, things of that nature. So uh, it's pretty good for getting kind of a 30,000 foot view of whatever book of the Bible you happen to be studying. Uh, again, that's available from Lifeway. Big fan of the Christ-Centered Exposition series 
um, edited, put together by David Platt, Danny Aiken, uh, and Tony Merida. Um, this is the Philippians volume, but any of them are great. So uh, they're not very expensive. Most of them you can grab for eight to ten dollars a book. Uh, so if you're studying a book, you can find those online or in your bookstore. Grab one of those, uh, and then a couple of more dense commentaries. Uh, this one is from Gordon Fee. I'll just show you the spine because I took the dust jacket off. Uh, but this is Paul's letter to the Philippians from uh, Gordon Fee. Um, again, pretty dense. You can see how thick that is. Uh, and then this from the Baker Exegetical series um, by Moises Silva. I probably mispronounced that name. Apologies to the author. Uh, but this one's also great as well, the second edition of Philippians. Now these commentaries are, again, they're a little denser. They get into uh, some of the grammar, some of the uh, original Greek uh, of Paul's letters or, or the Hebrew of the Old Testament. Uh, and so if that's something that you're comfortable using, by all means do so. If you're not, um, maybe stay out of some of the deeper waters uh, until you feel prepared so you don't get overwhelmed. So again, those are just some of the resources I've used in preparation for this study. Uh, I would also tell you, pray before, during, and after your study. Pray before you study. Pray as you study. And when you finish, pray over what you just learned. Always wrap your Bible study in prayer. We don't do this in a vacuum. And we don't want this to be purely academic. We want this to be done to the glory of God uh, and with the power of the Spirit. So always wrap your Bible study in prayer. And if you need to pause this video... Spend a little time in prayer before we continue on. Please feel free to do so. And then the last thing I'll tell you uh, is learn the context of the book that you're studying. Right? We don't always want to just think of how does this book apply to uh, 2020 and myself, but we always want to look at the context first. Right? The Bible can't say something it hasn't said, uh, and so we always look at the original context first, when it was written, why it was written, what it was meant to say to the people it was written to. And then we bring those truths and those principles into our modern day setting. So always learn the context of the book that you are studying. In the spirit of studying the context of the book that we are looking at, I want to give you guys some quick background information. A couple of things on the city of Philippi, uh, where this letter was addressed to the circumstances of Paul's writing it, and then a few of the themes that we're going to find as we walk through the book of Philippians. So to cover some of that stuff pretty quickly for you, um, some background on the city of Philippi itself. So uh, initially founded by the Greeks under a different name, uh, Alexander the Great, as he was uh, doing his conquest of the known world, he, he made it his capital. He named it for his father, uh, Philip of Macedon, which is why it's called Philippi. Uh, and so after that, um, years later, if you are a fan of literature uh, or history and you know of the assassination of Julius Caesar on the Ides of March, uh, the names of his assassins, Brutus and Cassius, uh, if you have read that play by Shakespeare, then you know that the final act takes place uh, outside of Philippi. It's a battle between uh, the army of the assassins, Brutus and Cassius, and the armies of Rome led by Octavian, who would become the emperor Caesar Augustus, the same one mentioned in Luke in the birth narrative, uh, and Mark Antony, who's loyal to uh, the Caesar. And so this big battle takes place outside of Philippi, where the uh, assassins are defeated. Uh, and then years later, it is the site, uh, close to the site of another major battle between Octavian and uh, Mark Antony. And Octavian is victorious again. And after both of these battles, the uh, members of the losing side were allowed to settle in that city. And so it became very heavily Roman after these uh, things took place. And then later, uh, Octavian, or Caesar Augustus at that point, uh, made it a Roman province, and so it is a city in Macedonia, in, in an area of Greece, but it is a Roman province, meaning it, it is effectively a Roman city, and this will be important later in the study. Uh, so it is effectively a Roman city governed by Roman law, 
it's a very important city. It's on a major highway uh, that runs between a couple of different ends of the empire. And so this would be a very key place for Paul to plant a church. Um, we see the story of how that church was kind of founded in Acts chapter 16. So if you want some background information, you can go check that out. Acts chapter 16, and you'll see where Paul and Silas and Luke arrived in Philippi and the founding of the church and how things went forward from there. So uh, that's kind of some background on the city of Philippi itself. The circumstances of the writing, uh, it's generally believed to be written between 60 and 62 AD, and it's one of what we call Paul's prison epistles. And so pretty widely accepted that he wrote this letter while he was imprisoned in Rome. Uh, awaiting a trial. And so he uh, receives uh, a message and he receives some support, most likely financial, from the text, uh, from the church in Philippi, maybe to help with his legal fees or his defense. Uh, and so he writes this letter in response to them. He writes to thank them. He writes to kind of inform them of his situation and how things are going for him. But then he also writes to address some issues that he's been made aware of within the church, most likely by the messenger, Epaphroditus, who brought this message to him. And so this is a very personal letter of Paul's, but there is a lot of theology wrapped up and woven through it uh, because he is not only telling them about himself, but he is also addressing some of these issues that he has been made aware of. Uh, and so some of these themes that we're going to see that Paul addresses very quickly, a lot of the themes and the theology that Paul covers in his letter they're found in his other letters. But Philippians is a little bit unique because this is the, the best example of where we see Paul take that theology and really apply it practically to how is this supposed to work in a Christian's life? How does this theology, how does this stuff really apply to the life of a believer? And so it's a great book to study if you're kind of wanting to figure out how does this stuff that I hear and that I learn, how is it really supposed to apply practically in the life of a believer? So we see a couple of uh, categories of these things. One is relationships with others. And we see Paul address things like standing against adversity from opposition, which we'll explore later. Uh, we see Paul talk about humility in our relationships with others. And we see him talk about unity among believers and the necessity of that unity within the church. We also see him talk about uh, his relationships with Christ. Specifically, he talks about the idea of uh, this believer's citizenship is in heaven, which we'll look at a little more closely. Uh, he also talks about joy in Christ. Um, he uses different kinds of words for joy uh, many, many times here in the book of Philippians, uh, possibly more than in any other letter that he wrote. So he's full of the idea of joy in Christ, even in difficult circumstances. And then really, all of this can be summed up in Paul's theme of the centrality of Christ, the importance of Christ as the center of our lives. Uh, to briefly illustrate that for you before we get started, looking at just a couple of verses here. I've heard the example used, and I can't remember exactly where I heard it, uh, and so apologies to whoever I'm not giving credit to. Uh, but I've heard the example given like this. If you imagine our solar system, and we have eight or nine planets, uh, because they cannot stop giving Pluto the runaround, we have eight or nine planets that all orbit the sun. And the sun's gravity is what holds these planets in place, keeps them in their orbits right where they need to be, uh, keeping everything in place. All of that is accomplished because the sun's gravity is powerful enough to hold all of these planets where they need to be. Now imagine that one of the planets, the Earth, got a little jealous of the sun and said, I feel like I should be in the center of the solar system and could somehow replace the sun. So we remove the sun, place the Earth in the center. Well, now we have a very big problem because the gravity that the Earth generates is not as powerful as the gravity that the sun generates. And so if we place the Earth at the center of the solar system, the other planets will fly off into deep space because there's not enough power holding them where they need to be. 
this is the same in our lives. We have a lot of things orbiting constantly in our lives. We have our families, we have our jobs, we have our hobbies, we have our faith, we have uh, all of the things that we have to do, all of the concerns, all of the worries, all of the activities we take part in, uh, all of these things that orbit in our lives, trying to figure out who we are and how we do these, these things together. And there's only one thing that is powerful enough to keep our lives in perfect orbit and to keep all of these things where they need to be, in the proper position. And that thing is Christ. He is the only one powerful enough to keep our lives in perfect orbit. If we try to put anything else at the center of our lives, money or fame or family, anything else that we try to substitute into the center of our lives will not be powerful enough and good enough to keep everything else in its proper place. Those can be good things, but they cannot be the center of your life. And so Paul really pushes this emphasis all the way through Philippians that Christ is the center of the believer's life. And if that is the case, everything else falls into the orbit it needs to be in. And so we're going to see that as we walk through the centrality of Christ and the importance of Christ being the center of our lives, everything else orbiting Him. Today in our study of Philippians, we're only going to look at the first two verses. This is the introduction here to Paul's letter. Now, if you're like me, you usually think of the introduction as a thing that you can skip over, and let's get to the important stuff. But we have to understand the introductions are not things that we skip over. They're a part of the letter. They're a part of the Word of God. And there's usually important stuff to be found even in those introductions. So we're going to take a look, if you've got your Bible, at Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Let's read together, and then we'll come back and we'll examine what we can see here. So this is, again, from the CSB says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, seems pretty simple, but when we dig into this, we see there's a lot of important information. And Paul really kind of unpacks here several of the themes that he wants to address to the church at Philippi. So let's look at what we've got. We always begin at the beginning. We'll work our way through. So first we see the greeting there. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. This is who it's coming from. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now what we see here, Paul usually includes in his greeting who is with him. And so here he includes Timothy. Now we don't know exactly what capacity Timothy is uh, with Paul in because we know Paul is in prison. Uh, but it's likely maybe Timothy is there um, as secretary, like for dictation. So rather than Paul writing the letter out by hand himself, he would dictate it to Timothy, who would write it. Um, that's just kind of a guess. Uh, again, we don't know exactly what Timothy's role is with Paul while he's there in prison. Uh, but we, we know he's there. And we know he's present. So he includes Timothy in there with him, and then he uh, adds this, this note behind them. All right, now usually Paul will address himself and kind of a title of his, like Paul, Apostle of Jesus Christ, and Silas, or whoever is with him. But here he, he puts himself and Timothy in this same category, servants of Christ Jesus. And CSB translates it servants. Uh, other translations give it the more accurate uh, to the Greek term, uh, slave. So the Greek term here is doulos, which means slave, literally slave. Um, there is no way that anybody would have read this word doulos in this Greek-speaking world and taken it to mean anything but slave, one who belongs to another. And so Paul is being very, very clear that he and Timothy consider themselves slaves to Christ, fully under his lordship following his commands and his will. And so we get this picture here uh, of what's kind of a common theme of Paul's letters, that, that this is not um, 
uh, a negative thing, but Paul considers this an honor to be a slave for Christ, to be a bond servant, some translations say, uh, to be bound forever to the person of Christ. He considers this an honor to have surrendered his life fully to the will of Christ under his lordship. And so uh, he makes this plain here again. He calls both himself and Timothy doulos or slaves of Christ. Uh, but we also see an important thing here. And this is one of the first hints we get of the themes that Paul wants to cover. Paul leaves out his typical, in most of his letters, apostolic greeting, where normally maybe he would say Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Here he leaves that out. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, but what we begin to see here is this theme of humility. That rather than addressing the church and calling himself Paul an apostle of Christ, he calls himself Paul a slave of Christ. And we begin to see this theme of humility come out in his letter. Uh, Tony Merida also points out in the uh, Christ Centered Exposition series that you see the grace that God gives, which we'll also come back to in a minute, but you see the grace that God gives in this address here because it comes from Paul and Timothy. And we know Paul's story uh, when he was Saul. He was a Pharisee who pursued and murdered Christians uh, fervently. Timothy, we know from the Scripture, his mother was Jewish and his father was Greek. And somehow Timothy found his way uh, through the influence of others to become a Christian. And so here we have two people um, who were not raised Christian necessarily, um, especially in the case of Paul, who have found their ways to become slaves of Christ through the grace of God. And so uh, there we see again that, that beginning of that theme of humility. So Paul greets them, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, and then he gives the address who this is written to. And he writes, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. And so remember, as we're going through, don't be afraid to mark in your Bible and make notes of some of the things that you're, that you're seeing or hearing. Um, do your own study. If something new stands out to you, make a note of that. But don't be afraid to write in your Bible. And so here in the address, uh, he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. So that word saints in the Greek is hagios. Uh, and it really means holy or holy ones, set apart ones. Uh, it's just a term used uh, for believers often in the New Testament. But we get an extra layer kind of added to this if you go back to Acts 16. And you see who some of the earliest members of this Philippian church were. Uh, one of the very earliest members was Lydia, who Paul stayed with. He arrived in Philippi, preached the gospel. Acts says that uh, her heart was open to the gospel, and Paul stayed with her. Uh, he and uh, his companions, which means that she was probably pretty wealthy and had a large enough house for them to stay in. Uh, so she was one of the earliest members of that Philippian church. We also um, can, can surmise that uh, the demon-possessed girl that they cast the demon out of would most likely have become a member of that church as well. Paul cast the demon out of her um, and set her free um, from that. And so she would likely have uh, stayed with Paul um, and learned from him while he was there and maybe become a member of that church. Uh, and then we also see the conversion of the Philippian jailer, right? Because they cast the demon out of the girl, kind of cost her owners uh, some of their money-making. They were thrown into jail, and, and then there's the earthquake, and, and their uh, doors are open, but they don't leave, and they prevent the Philippian jailer from committing suicide when he thinks he's lost his prisoners, and then he and his family are saved. And so they would also have become early members of that church. And so we see here um, Lydia and uh, a jailer who was part of falsely imprisoning Paul and Silas, and this demon-possessed slave girl, some of the earliest members of this church, and here Paul calls all of them saints, holy ones, not because of anything that they have done, but because of the grace of God. Uh, we see another little uh, opening of one of Paul's themes here where he addresses his letter then to all the saints. 
not to any particular ones. And taking those three that we just discussed, you really see three um, economic classes, three classes of people. Lydia, who would have been fairly wealthy uh, because we know she had enough space in her house for, for Paul and his companions, and she uh, was probably pretty well off. Um, the jailer, who was probably middle class or the artisan class, and then the, the slave girl. But all of them are united under that term saints. And then Paul goes on to say, in Christ Jesus. And so what we see here is this theme of unity. This theme of unity that no matter where you're from, what your background is, what your current status is, who you are, who your family is, first and foremost, if you are in Christ, you are a Christian and you are united in that, whether you are a rich Christian, a poor Christian, uh, no matter what race of Christian you are, nationality, what language you speak, you are first and foremost Christian. And so we begin to see this theme of unity here in Paul's letter that he will address as he continues on. He goes on and he says that this is not only to uh, just the saints in Christ Jesus, but specifically we know to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Uh, and now, obviously, he's writing this to the church in Philippi, so that part seems obvious. Um, but there's a little bit of allusion here to his upcoming theme of citizenship and where do you find your citizenship. And, and really, these um, commentaries, these people who are much smarter than me, say that Paul is using a little bit of distancing language here when he says to the saints who are in Philippi, not necessarily to the Philippian saints, but to the saints who are in Philippi. Citizenship in Philippi was a big deal because they were a city uh, in Greece, but given Roman status. If you lived in Philippi, you were a Roman citizen, and they were very proud of that. It was a big deal. And so Paul is going to play off that theme of citizenship that would have been so popular in Philippi and express to them that just like he said you are first and foremost a Christian, no matter where you're from or what your class is, if you are a Christian, your citizenship is primarily in heaven, not on earth. And you need to live like it. And he'll explore that more later in uh, the end of chapter 1. And so he addresses this idea of citizenship using that language of to the saints who are in Philippi. And then he goes on and he says, including the overseers and the deacons. Now, it's possible here that Paul is just simply recognizing some of the, the offices of the church. Um, it is also possible that Paul is continuing his, his theme of humility and he's leading into his talk on humility because what we see is not only did Paul exclude his apostolic greeting, but he included these titles, these positions of honor for these people in the church, the overseers and deacons. So maybe if you're taking notes in your Bible, you can make a note next to that. I have one in mind. Uh, it just kind of refers me to chapter 2, verse 3, where Paul says to, in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. And so we see him doing that here. He leaves out his title of apostle, but he puts in their titles of overseers and deacons. It continues this theme of humility as he opens his letter. And then we see uh, his uh, proper greeting where he writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this word grace here, Paul is kind of playing on the typical greeting of the time, which would have been the Greek word uh, kyrain, which would just translate greeting, uh, would mean to rejoice. Uh, in the Greek, and he has changed kyrain to charis, which means grace, and then he's added the Hebrew word shalom, which is peace there, um, and he's kind of emphasizing here that these, these things that believers have, grace to you from the Lord Jesus Christ, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is the gift of God given to believers, the grace that we don't deserve. And the outflow of that, the result of that, is then peace. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And this peace that Paul speaks of, he's also going to kind of cover 
uh, different areas here in his letter. But this is not only uh, a, a current peace, temporal peace here on earth, peace in the midst of trials, peace in the face of adversity, um, but that peace here on earth in adversity is tied to the hope of eternal peace with God that we have in the future. The fact that uh, if we place our faith and our hope in the sacrifice of Christ and, and in the uh, sufficiency of that, if we repent of our sin, that we have hope of eternal peace with God. That lends itself to uh, current temporal peace here on earth, even in the midst of trials and adversity. And so we see here this theme of joy in Christ, in the grace and peace that he gives, and the centrality of Christ, because Paul makes it plain here in his greeting that the key to the Christian life, the key to the grace and the peace that we all search for and we desire, is found in Christ. It's found in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we see his themes of joy in Christ and the centrality of Christ. So I know we went through that kind of quickly, um, hopefully in the following weeks when I'm not also giving you background information and, and themes and all that sort of thing. Uh, we won't have to move as quickly. Feel free to, to go back and watch again or pause in certain places to uh, hear again what you need to hear again or to, to see things again. Um, but I do want to summarize for you briefly kind of what we see in these first two verses and then uh, quickly look at a couple of application points for us because we always want to figure out how does this apply to my life. And so quickly in summary, really what we see here is Paul's greeting to a church that he loves very much. They're very dear to him. And we really see here his unfolding of the themes that he wants to address with them in his letter. He is writing to thank them for their gift. He is writing to inform them of his current situation. But he wants to cover some of these themes as well and to address some of these issues. And so we see his emphasis on humility uh, in regard to others. We see his emphasis on the citizenship of believers and where that's found. His emphasis on unity within the body. We see his emphasis then on the joy found in Christ and the centrality of Christ in our lives and how he must be at the center of the believer's life. And so then some application points. Um, Gordon Fee points some out in, in his uh, commentary. Great summary of application. Uh, so just a few of those things. Um, it can be difficult for us just as, as fallen sinful people, uh, but we need humility. We must relate to others in humility. We must, Paul says later, um, think of others as more important than ourselves. And this is not just a... First century issue, this is a 21st century issue. We always need to be reminded of our need for humility before God and with others. Uh, we are scattered right now because of the things taking place with this virus uh, around the world and the churches, uh, most churches are having to meet um, in their living rooms uh, and away from the campus. And so this is a great time for us to remember that we are united as the body of Christ. We need unity in these times when it uh, has us scattered around and, and things are a little different. This is an excellent time for us to remember the need for unity. And when we do return together, uh, I tell my students frequently, church is like a family and families argue. And the longer you are with people, the more you find things about them that irritate you and get on your nerves. But we must practice unity then as well, because we are, before we are anything else, we are believers united in the person of Christ. Uh, Tony Merida uh, points out, if you've ever wondered where to find joy, if you have searched for joy, not just happiness, but true joy in your life, the answer to where that joy is found is in Philippians. It's found in Christ. And so we'll explore this as we go through where and how do we find that joy in Christ that Paul speaks of. Uh, and then also, again, the centrality of Christ to our lives. This is a key application that we must understand. Christ has to be the center. Everything else has to come after him. Families, spouses, jobs, money, the hobbies, your kids' activities and sports and all the things that we, we fill our calendars up with. All of these things have to come after 
Christ. He must be centered in our lives because nothing else can hold our lives in their proper orbits. And so these are just some of the applications we can take here from Philippians. Um, you can feel free to look for more of your own, how some of these things may apply specifically to you. Um, always remember, one of my professors uh, says in Bible Exposition that when it comes to the Bible, interpretation is one, but application is many. The Bible is meant by its divine author to say a certain thing. Interpretation is one, but application is many. And so the way that one of these things applies to your life may be a little different from mine. Maybe you feel uh, you really need to key on on that theme of humility. And that's something that you've been struggling with. And that's really something that needs to be applied to your life. Maybe you've really been searching for joy. Uh, and, and someone else isn't really searching as hard as you are. They, they, they are joyful. They found joy in Christ. But maybe you have really been searching for years for true joy. And that's the application you need to focus on here in the book of Philippians, is where to find that joy in Christ. So remember as we study that interpretation is one, but application is many. I'm excited to go through this study with you guys to continue on. So I hope you enjoyed this today. Uh, feel free to leave comments or get in touch with me, send me an email, uh, and let me know what you thought or if you have any uh, questions or comments, uh, and then look out for episode two coming out next Thursday. See you guys then. Thank you.